Welcome, Mr. Pong. Pong, where you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for providing me and other stakeholders the opportunity to address some real key questions regarding the U.S. trade relationship with India. I represent the Alliance for Fair Trade with India, or AFI, which is a business group devoted to fostering a more open trade relationship between the world's two largest democracies. India is our 13th largest trade partner, a figure that represents not just how far we have come, but how much work is left to do. With total trading goods of $57.8 billion in 2011, up from $13.49 billion just 10 years before that, the potential for greater commerce and investment is right. Unfortunately, our current relationship has stalled with little recent progress of note. From forced localization of industry and manufacturing, pharmaceuticals and telecommunications, to anti-innovation policies that not only hurt foreign companies but domestic ones as well, India must be held to account for its discriminatory practices and should be strongly encouraged to become a responsible stakeholder in the global economy. While there are a plethora of anti-competitive policies in India today that discriminate against U.S. industries, I will attempt only to focus on a few and I'll supplement uh, my remarks today in more detailed written comments at a later date. First, intellectual property rights remain a very difficult topic in India. Anti-CAM courting legislation is still nowhere to be found. It was notably absent from recent copyright legislation, despite its status as a long-standing nuisance to foreign and domestic film industries. The same legislation similarly failed to lay out adequate protections for illegal internet downloads of movies, music, and other data files an area which will continue to grow as India becomes more interconnected by the World Wide Web. While India has had made some small gestures to international standards and governing bodies, it has done little of substance on the real issues of IP protections. Beyond simple counterfeit goods like DVDs and illegal downloads, the pharmaceutical industry has been hit this past year by a number of unfair and troubling rulings, including the revocation of numerous patents by the Indian Controller General of Patents and the Intellectual Property Appellate Board the denial of patent applications, as well as the approval of generic drugs during a patent's term. This has wreaked havoc on foreign competitors, who are clearly denied protections even as domestic manufacturers reap the benefits of discriminatory practices. Second, I want to highlight the disturbing disinterest in bringing innovative technologies to the country. India has long required burdensome transfer of technology requirements for the procurement of equipment and goods related to telecommunications. In a nation with a rapidly expanding network and a vibrant technology sector, India's policies do not support trade in the highest standards of equipment, but instead provide advantages to its domestic manufacturers. Although the Indian government announced that it would discontinue its preferential market access, or PMA, program for security-related equipment and goods in the private sector, we remain concerned that the government will maintain PMA for government procurement. It is our hope that India will consider joining the WTO government procurement agreement and adjust its observer status to one of party to the agreement joining other robust economies, including the United States, Singapore, Japan, the European Union, and Korea. As other countries, including China, Ukraine, and the Kyrgyz Republic, are in the process of negotiating accession to the agreement, we similarly encourage India to consider more competitive policies in regards to government procurement. Such policies not only hinder foreign companies, but ultimately limit Indian innovation while keeping the people of India from receiving the most advanced equipment on the global market technologies that could only facilitate stronger Indian development and progress in the coming years. Finally, in spite of recent calls for greater investment in the renewable energy sector, and solar in particular, the Indian government continues to demand forced local content requirements. Specifically, India's solar program discriminates against U.S. solar equipment by requiring solar energy producers to use Indian manufactured solar cells and modules, and in some cases by offering subsidies to those developers for using domestic equipment instead of imports. As you know, USTR has initiated a challenge to these policies at the WTO, and in a move after the applause, requested dispute settlement consultations with India earlier this week. I could go on about the anti-competitive nature of India's <coughs> metal and metallic derivatives industry, its desire to keep innovative agricultural products out of China, out of India, and its divisive tone at major multilateral forums, as in Bali, in this past December. However, across multiple sectors, the theme is the same. The Indian government provides ceremonial acts to prove it is working on the continued liberalization of its economy, but the results do not change. India has a significant way to go to become a responsible stakeholder in international commerce. While other countries continue to work towards greater liberalization and free trade, India remains highly protectionist over a range of industries. In order to better the trading relationship with the United States and to encourage its own local industry, India must work to reduce barriers to trade and market entry. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>
Our next witness is Arvid Sebramanian, Senior Fellow of the Peterson Institute of International Economics, Center for Global Development. Welcome, Mr. Sebramanian. Um, <coughs> uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, slide, please. Um, uh, my job today will be to, you know, provide a, a kind of macro assessment of, uh, of India's trade and India-US trade relations, and I will leave it to my colleagues to focus more on, on the sectoral stuff. Um, I want to focus on three issues on the technical side. U.S.-India integration, India's trade regime more broadly, recent policy developments, and then I will go on to offer some policy conclusions. Uh, slide, please. Um, my first point is that U.S. bilateral, India bilateral economic integration remains very strong. In both goods and services, and indeed in FDI, U.S.-India trade has been growing at about 17% a year, more vibrant than overall U.S. trade, more vibrant than India's trade with the EU and Japan. Um, next slide, please. Important to note that this economic integration does not come at the expense of U.S. employment at a time when the U.S. economy is so slack. This is a chart that shows uh, the U.S. trade imbalance with both China and India. India, roughly, almost roughly balanced trade with China, deficit of about 300 to 350 billion. So this is on India-US bilateral integration, then there's more in my written statement. Next slide, uh, please. On, on India's trade regime more strongly, uh, more broadly, what's true of US-India trade is also true for India's overall integration. Trade to GDP has been rising enormously, consistently, and sharply over time. That's the left chart. And what is really surprising is, from a cross-country perspective, India's is a highly, unusually, significantly open economy when account is taken of its uh, level of development and its size. Small countries usually trade very little. A, a, very, a lot large countries trade very little. But if you control for that, India is a st strikingly uh, open trader. Uh, next slide, please. And similarly, what was true about India-US relations is true more broadly. India adds to global demand, is not following beggar thy neighbor policies, and it's reflected in its current account deficits. Uh, next slide, please. Um, India's manufacturing tariffs are now very close to OECD norms. Next slide, please. However, its services sector remains highly protected. As you can see from this chart, India is way up uh, amongst the most protected uh, in the world. Um, Next slide, please. Now, which comes to my third point. How should we evaluate recent Indian trade policy actions? Uh, I think it's very complicated, and therefore I've proposed a framework for evaluating it, which is here in this, uh, in this slide. A number of points I want to uh, highlight here. First, actions encompass both that uh, target uh, foreign uh, service provi foreign providers, what I call pure border measures, there are those in the middle, which uh, in the second panel, which domestic regulations that affect both foreigners and, and, and domestic, uh, but predominantly foreign. And the last one that impact equally on domestic and foreign business. So there are all kinds of services measure, uh, policy actions going on, point number one. Point number two, my first column, uh, there, are, there has been sweeping liberalization as well. Uh, I'm going to highlight two of them. Agricultural tariffs are now virtually zero. And uh, India has basically opened up to FDI within one year what it hadn't over the last 50 years. Now, India's capital account is virtually open, and FDI is liberal, liberal, liberalized in, in most sectors. There are, of course, as many will point out, restrictive actions have been taken, local content requirements, um, taxation policy. But some of these have been reversed, like the, uh, the PMA that my colleague just referred to. Some are being adjudicated in, in the WTO. And frankly, on some, the, it's the yardstick for evaluation that's going to determine how you evaluate them. You know, uh, the land acquisition bill has affected both domestic and foreign business. The LCRs in government procurement are not inconsistent with India's WTO obligations. And in some cases, like the civil nuclear law, the problem is not that the actions have been restrictive, but they've not, not gone far enough. And I think you should keep that in mind when you evaluate recent trade policy actions. Next slide, please. Um, normally, I, I wouldn't have gone into intellectual property, but I, I happen to be one of the three original drafters of the intellectual property agreement, and, and so I, I want to provide a macro assessment of that. Next slide, please. Now, 
Um, first point to note is that it is not the case that Indian measures recently have only been of, of a restrictive sort. Actually, you've seen measures that have encompassed the positive, the negative, and frankly, some which are very difficult to evaluate. The most positive development has been due process. Uh, India's, you know, in the last two years, uh, IP-related processes have been extremely expeditious. Verdicts have been transparent and well explained. Recourse to appeal to higher authority has been provided. Remuneration has been in line with sometimes even greater than international norms. And several recent decisions have gone in favor of foreign patent holders. So, so that's the good news. The bad news, I think, is that there are some aspects of IP law, especially Section 3D and compulsory licensing, that frankly are problematic. Uh, and I think uh, these should be taken to the WTO uh, for adjudication for reasons that I outlined in, in my testimony, written testimony. But there is a category of measures, I would urge you to say, which are frankly very difficult to assess, especially compulsory licensing to ensure affordable access. Why do I say that? If the standard is just IP in the rich countries, yes, India falls short. But you can have many different other standards. Is it consistency with international obligations? Is it uh, where India's IP's regime is compared with other countries at comparable levels of development? Or most important and most difficult, is it consistent with a complicated welfare calculus in India that balances three objectives? What should be India's fair share to contributing to the fixed cost of global R&D? How should it promote domestic technology? And at the same time, provide affordable access uh, to medicines? I think this is a fiendishly difficult task. And I think uh, the jury is open on you know, how different countries should do this. And, and I think going forward, there is an emerging model of cooperation which some uh, uh, Gilead Sciences, a uh, uh, California-based company, uh, is trying out with Indian companies, which combines effective IP protection with tiered pricing. Uh, and, and so maybe that's a, a model going forward. Um, now I want to turn to the conclusions. Uh, next slide, please. So I have two sets of conclusions. On the economic side, I would argue that India's economy is a source of concern now, but largely because of a deteriorating investment climate, for both domestic and foreign business, declining growth, and a, a, a macroeconomic situation that is still fragile. Uh, <clears throat> now, the concerns of US business should be addressed seriously and expeditiously. I think many of them should be adjudicated in the WTO. But I think we must bear in mind that these are mostly sectoral, and they should not obscure very positive developments in broader policies, such as India's opening to FDI. And they should not obscure what I think are very positive, sustained trends in actual trade outcomes, which India has achieved with the US, with the rest of the world, and without harming others like some other countries, major countries that we know about. Last slide, please. Um, I also want to draw a set of policy conclusions uh, more broadly. I think trade policy does not occur in a vacuum. So I think when this body deliberates, I think it's worth keeping a number of things in mind. First, I would urge you to exercise care in rendering unilateral verdicts that reflect sectoral interests and carry risks of punitive actions. I would urge you also to adopt a forward-looking perspective because essentially, uh, you know, the, the political change is happening in India, a new government is likely to come in, and I think it's important that we set off the new relationship on a positive footing. I, I think it also uh, needs to be taken into account that India and, and the US have a number of shared security uh, and strategic interests in Asia. Uh, so I think overall I would conclude by saying I think we need to create the conditions for best addressing these economic and strategic concerns. We need to revive trade cooperation and perhaps eventually move towards an, an India-US free trade agreement. Uh, uh, in conclusion, I, I would like to just add, Mr. Uh, Chairman and, and members, that you know, anger and, frust and legitimate frustration are often louder than uh, uh, louder sentiments than than contentment and, and happiness. So I think you should bear that asymmetry in mind when you proceed on your deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you.